Let's turn tonight in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 38. The book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 38. And I've told you in the past, just by way of information, that the book of Isaiah is like the Bible in miniature. There's 66 chapters, which corresponds to the 66 books of the Bible. It's divided into two parts, 39 chapters in one part, 27 in the other, which exactly corresponds to the Old and New Testament. And of course, Isaiah is known as the evangelical prophet. And in the second part of the book of Isaiah stands that great chapter, Isaiah 53, where we have Christ revealed as the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So what we're turning tonight to Isaiah chapter 38, Isaiah chapter 38, and if you found the place, we'll read from verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord, and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Isaiah ten degrees backwards. So the sun returned ten degrees by which degrees it was gone down. The writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go down to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. I said I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord in the land of the living. I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. My age is departed and removed from me. As a shepherd's tent, I have, cut, I have cut off like a weaver's my life. He will cut me off with pining sickness. From day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. I reckon till morning that as a lion, so will he break all my bones. From day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. Like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter. I did mourn as a dove. Mine eyes fail with looking upward. O oh Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. What shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me, and himself hath done it. I shall go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul. O oh Lord, by these things men live. And in all these things is the life of my spirit. So wilt thou recover me and make me to live? Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. For the grave cannot praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. For Isaiah had said, Let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boy, and he shall recover. Hezekiah also had said, What is the sign that I shall go up? To the house 
of the Lord. Amen. May the Lord stamp his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now, my text tonight is taken from Isaiah chapter 38 and the verse 17. It reads as follows, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. My theme tonight is entitled, The Testimony of a Sickly King. King Hezekiah was one of the greatest kings in the history of Judah besides David and Solomon. He was born in the year 740 BC, and he died in 686 BC. As I've said, he was a godly king. He was one who lived through some horrible times. He was a man of passion. He lived with a desire to please God and do what was right in his sight. He was a man of prayer. Isaiah 38 is a model prayer. It records one of his great prayers. He was a man of power. It was under his leadership that the uh, nation of Judah experienced many great religious reforms. Whenever he assumed the throne at the age of 25, he set about a real work of reformation in the land. He broke down the images raised up by his ungodly father. He removed the culture of idolatry out of the land. He refused to bow the knee to the king of Assyria. He refused to give in to the demands of the um, Philistines. And as a godly king, he he sought with God's help and grace to establish the law of God as a rule for life in the territory of Judah. Listen to his own testimony. If you look with me, he says in Isaiah 38 and the verse 3, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. The same thing is recorded in um, 2 Kings Um, chapter 20 and verse 3 I beseech thee O Lord remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight and Hezekiah wept sore see Hezekiah was a man of the old school he was willing of course to use his position as a king to be a positive influence for God and for good in the land and I'll tell you it wasn't easy it was difficult Remember, this is a day of general apostasy in the land of Judah. People in their thousands had turned away from the Lord. And yet this godly king Hezekiah, at the age of 25, he persevered. And he sought to do what he could to recover the nation spiritually for God. Now, even though he was a man of great passion and a man of prayer, a man of power who had in his mind to instrument great reforms in the land of Judah. Hezekiah was also a man who experienced many problems. He he coped with national problems. He also experienced personal problems in his life. In other words, he didn't live a carefree life. Shortly after his coronation and desire to follow the Lord with all his heart, he he was brought face to face with a conflict uh, with the surrounding nations. He faced a Siege for two to three years led by the king of Assyria. He tried to starve the people of Judah into surrender. And of course, Hezekiah prayed to God. And God answered prayer. God sent an angel one night who killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers before breaking the, the, the siege and um, the, the saving of the city and the people. In fact, For the first 14 years of his reign, he faced hardship and trouble. He had many particular trials. The future was unsure. At times, he didn't know what to do. And all he could do was cry to God. And yet he had learned that vital lesson to spread the matter before the Lord in prayer. Now, during his 14-year reign as king, he not only faced national crisis, but he faced a deeply bitter personal crisis. Whenever he was 39, he became terminally ill. So ill that he was staring death in the face. He was told by the prophet Isaiah, who was sent by God, that he was going to die. 
Look at chapter 38, verse 1. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it. Sorry, the wrong reference. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and saith unto him, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. This was a somber, sober message. Thou shalt die and not live. And once again, Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord about this particular personal problem. And the Lord answered prayer. The Lord miraculously and wonderfully extended his life by 15 years and even gave him a sign by turning the sundial back by a, a, a number of degrees. And after his recovery, the Lord had answered prayer. Hezekiah records his testimony in Saul. And here it is in the page of Holy Scripture in Isaiah 38, recorded by this evangelical prophet. And verse, 30, or, or verse 17 of chapter 38 records the, the testimony, as I have called it, of a sickly king. This man who experienced the greatness, the goodness, and the grace of the power of God in his life. It's a truly remarkable testimony. Now, now let's look at a couple of things from the text of Scripture. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul, delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. I want you to notice the crisis that Hezekiah faced. He says, Behold, for peace. I had great bitterness. He described what he faced as bitterness, this national crisis and this personal crisis. The Hebrew word for bitterness is the word mare. And it literally means bitter. In the Hebrew Bible, the word mare appears twice and it reads bitter, bitter. And that's why we've got the translation great bitterness. It speaks to the very depth of his pain. The word refers to the emotional response to a destructive heart, crashing situation. A feeling of hopelessness engulfs his heart and mind. And as I think about the crisis that he faced, I want you to learn this, that sickness and suffering can come to the best of God's people. What do you do when things go wrong in the nation, in the church, in your home life, in your own personal life? Hezekiah was a good and godly king. He was a man using his influence as king for God. He was a man with the spirit of the reformers. And yet he fell ill. And it wasn't just a, a, an illness like a cold or a flu. He, he, he was terminally ill. Sickness and illness came to this good man. And it was all to do with the mysterious providence of God in his life. And nobody could, but God could explain why. Because God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. And as someone has said to me years ago, God is too good to do anything bad. And God is too wise to make a mistake. And the Bible says, as for God, his way is perfect. We've got to bow the knee to God. To his sovereign eternal purposes. And even when God's people are doing a great work for God, despite all the crisis that they face, God at times can step into their life and bring sickness and suffering. You think of pastors tonight all over the world that are in prison for their love of Christ and for the cause of the gospel in prison because they're gospel preachers. You think of people over the world that are being persecuted because of the, the association with Christ and the Lord's name tonight. And we could, we could multiply that. Also learn that death is a reality for all. He was on the throne at the age of 25. He died at the age of 54. He fell ill when he was 39. You see, the young and old will die. It was only by the grace of God that God added 15 years to his life. Now imagine tonight, at the age of 39, before he's seen his 40th birthday, which is a milestone for many, he is told 
You're not going to live. You're going to die. And it's got a word from the Lord. It's the Lord's prophet that tells them that. Can you imagine if that was one of you? you? Remember, death is no respecter of persons. Death comes to the young and the old, as I've said, in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And yet many people tonight in that age category do not think of death. We never live in light of the thought, well, well, I could be dead before my next birthday. Doesn't the Bible say, boast not thyself of tomorrow? For no man knoweth what a day may bring forth. Do you know what tomorrow's going to bring? Do you know what the rest of the year is going to unfold? Doesn't the Lord Jesus say sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof? Imagine God sending a messenger to you. And the message is this. You're not going to live. You're going to die. And you've got to set your house in order. What does that mean? That, that means get your affairs sorted out. Get your entire life sorted out. I want you to learn something else. And Hezekiah discovered this at the age of 39. That the salvation of a soul was the most important thing that mattered in life. Because there must be preparation for death. And how did he prepare for death? By seeking God. And asking God for mercy. And asking God for grace. And if you read from um, the uh, verse um, 9 right through to the, to the end of the chapter, uh, uh, especially to, to verse 20, from 9 to 20, Hezekiah is, is seeking God uh, uh, and he's making preparation for death. He's thinking about the grace and mercy of God that he needs for his own soul. Remember what Isaiah the prophet said in Isaiah 55 and uh, verses um, 6 and 7 Seek ye the Lord while he may be found Call ye upon him while he is near Let the wicked forsake his way And the unrighteous man his thoughts And let him return unto the Lord And he will have mercy upon him And to our God For he will abundantly part I could hear Isaiah the prophet Saying those very words to Hezekiah Hezekiah this is what you've got to do You've got to seek the Lord You've got to call upon him Hezekiah you've got to forsake your wickedness Hezekiah, you've got to return to the Lord with all your heart. You've got to call upon him for mercy. And remember, he will abundantly pardon your sin. You see, this was heartbreaking news to Hezekiah. He has no heir. He's age 39. There's no one to follow him on the throne. What's going to happen to the land? If you look at the text, it says, Behold for peace. I had great bitterness. The word behold means to gaze and understand. Think about this. When, when this heartbreaking news came to me, I was robbed of peace. I was brought into a state of brokenness and bitterness. I was looking death right in the face. What a statement. Not just bitterness, but great bitterness. The adjective describes it. He was robbed of peace and joy. He, 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 he knew nothing about safety and, and certainty and enjoyment. And there's the crisis that he faced. I want you to see, secondly, the condition that he felt. If you look at the text, it says, For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Notice the words, my sins. In this crisis that he faced, here was the main condition that he felt in his soul. He was brought face to face at that hour when he was told he was going to die. My sins. See, see Hezekiah was not born a man of God. He was born like any other person. Psalm 51 verse 4, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Remember, he had an ungodly father. His father was a man of idolatry, a man of vice, a man of abandonment to God. So he didn't grow up in a godly home. He grew up in an ungodly home. And I think of him here specifying his sin. My sin. He's thinking of his personal sin. He's accepting the fact that he's to blame. My means possession. 
They belong to me. He wasn't thinking about his background or his ungodly upbringing. He wasn't thinking about the bad influences of others in the life of his home. He wasn't thinking about his company as a young man. Think of the word sins. It's in the plural. More than one. He's thinking about the course of his life. He's thinking about his habits. We'd also have to think tonight about the sorrow of sin. We could underline the word bitterness. Isn't it interesting that the prophet Jeremiah also made reference to this particular aspect of the sorrow of sin? Listen to what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 4 and in the verse 18. Let me read it to you. Jeremiah 4 and 18. This is what he says. Thy way and thy doings have procured thee these things unto thee. This is thy wickedness because it is bitter, because it reacheth unto thine heart. You see, there is such a thing tonight as the sorrow of sin. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard and the transgressor learns that that sin is a bitter thing. Yes, there is such a thing as the pleasure of sin for a season. But, but, but after that season is gone, sin can become a bitter and a binding chain to one's heart and one's life. Think of the subject of sin, my sins. He's facing up to the reality of it. Think of the sentence of his sin. He says, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. And you think of those words, the pit of corruption. The pit refers to a trap to catch an animal in. Hezekiah's heading for a meeting with death. Where does sin lead to? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Sin leads to the pit of corruption. In other words, he he realizes that his whole life has been entangled in a a, a pit of filth and pollution that has brought him to despair and ruin and pain. Isn't this what the psalmist talked about in Psalm 40? He said, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. Think of those words, a horrible pit. Out of the miry clay. And um, the the psalmist realized that he too was living a life of corruption. A life where he's entangled in the filth and pollution of his own sinful lifestyle. Now that spiritually speaking, he was undone. What was true of David, true of Hezekiah, is true of each of us. Have we specified our sin? Can we talk about my sin? Can we think about the, the shame of sin? And the sorrow that it brings to our lives before God and the lives of us. We talk about the subject at all. Can we think about the sentence, not only what sin is, but where it leads to, what it does? I know this isn't pleasant. But it's true. We've got to recognize and face up to our spiritual uncleanness, our spiritual unworthiness before the Lord. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible talks about being sold under sin. The the Bible talks about, um, ye hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. If God views us as sinners, then we must specify. We must think of the shame and sorrow and face up to the subject and the sentence of sin. Because if God views us as sinners, then we must take that place. That's where many have gone wrong. Many young people think today sin's not an issue. They brush it off. It doesn't concern or trouble them. And that's because they haven't realized or sensed in a conscious way their true spiritual state. They're, they're, they're not aware of it. And they may argue, but I'm not a drunkard. I'm not a harlot. I'm not a thief. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a murderer. But that doesn't mean to say that you're not born a sinner by nature and practice. What about your secret sins? Your public sins, your open sins, the sins of presumption, the sins of omission, the sins of commission, even the sin of unbelief, the sin of not loving God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. So many. That's the condition that he felt, my sins. Very quickly, I want you to think thirdly of the conversion that Hezekiah found. I want you to think of this. Here he is 
in a polluted pit of corruption. And he's powerless to save himself. He's like David in a horrible pit, in a life of depravity, in a life of inability. He cannot lift himself out of it. He has no strength or power of his own. He's dead in sin. He's deep in sin. And he's depraved in his sin. And he finds no answer in self. He can't lift himself out. But glory to God, he discovered a way out, a way of deliverance. And that answer is found in the grace and goodness of God. God intervened by his saving power. Think of this man languishing in the prison house of sin. And then he's lifted by the power of the Savior. We were singing there, love lifted me. Look at verse 17. But thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. Do you see that? Psalm 50 or Psalm 40 verse 2 Who did the lifting? He brought me up also out of In other words The Lord did the lifting Salvation's all of God The Bible tells us Timothy says This is a faithful saying Worthy of all acceptation That Christ Jesus Come into the world To save sinners Of whom I am chief It's the Lord who can set The sinner free Hi. Here's the answer his infinite love. The margin in the Hebrew is, he loved my soul from the pit. Spurgeon talked about being loved into grace. Isn't that the message of the gospel? John 3 and 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Doesn't the Bible tell us there in the book of Romans and Romans chapter 5 and the verse 8 But God commended his love toward us And while we were yet sinners Christ died for us Did, Didn't Paul talk about the Son of God who loved me And gave himself for me Love lifted me James Rowe wrote the hymn I, I was trying to find out some information about the circumstances and background To that hymn Why did he write it? I, I thought of my friend William in the Gilligan prison. Of course, he was thinking about Constable, though. But what we could think about Christ. Love lifted me because Christ is the very embodiment of God's love. You think tonight of how the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, left heaven to come into this sin-cursed world and went all the way to Mount Calvary and died there in agony and blood outside the city walls of Jerusalem. All because he loved sinners. And all because he died to save and rescue sinners. Not because we deserved it. But out of love for sinners. And I can understand tonight that we ought to love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. And we ought to love Christ. We love the Savior. We can say that. Lovest thou me more than these? Like Peter? Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. But what I don't understand tonight is his love for me as a sinner. He alone is mighty to save. And he can come and say, I love you because I love you. But thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. That's the conversion that he found. And notice, as we finish, the cleansing that he foretold. Because remember, he's, he's singing now, he's praising God. This is after his recovery from this terminal illness. God has extended his life by 15 years. And he has a testimony now. And what's his testimony all about? For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. In other words, the sin problem has been dealt with. Cast out of sight. Cast behind God's back. See, God, of course, just doesn't wink at sin and pretend it's not really there. He deals with it. And how does he deal with it? He puts sin away. What a statement. The man feels that he's now cleansed and pardoned from all his sin. And he can experience and enjoy not only peace with God, but the peace of God. And he knew that the knowledge of forgiveness of sins was something that was beyond him and outside of him. He knew that someone else had to do it. And who could alone do it? Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. I think tonight of many that would fear a public exposure of their lifestyle. Could you imagine if every sin of thought and word and deed was being broadcast to the world that we had committed from the day of our birth right up to the time when we're appointed to die? Don't many young people live in fear of their parents finding out who they're with, where they're at, the way they behave outside the home? Do you fear standing before God? When the books are opened and the book of life with your name on it and all is disclosed, every thought, every word and every deed. And it's not only disclosed, but God will be dealt, dealing with it. And what will God say in that day? Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Your sin can be dealt with tonight. It doesn't have to be disclosed. You don't have to be among the damned tonight. How can your sin be dealt with if you confess it to the Lord? Whenever he says, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back, it meant that he had an open, honest confession about his sin. It also meant that he, he had forsaken his sin. For whoso confesseth his sin and forsaketh it shall find mercy. There's mercy tonight with the Lord. Here's the cleansing that he talked about. The cleansing that he foretold in the song that would all who would listen. Oh yes, here's the crisis that he faced. Great bitterness. There was a day when he was told he's going to die and he was told to prepare. Here's the condition that he felt. My sins. And he specified it. The subject was true and real to him. And then the conversion that he found, love lifted me from the pit of corruption. C can you talk about that tonight? Do you know anything about this cleansing? Can you go and lay your head in the pillow and say it's well with my soul? Why? Because my sins of thought and word and deed have all been put behind God's back. And God has made a promise. Thy sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. Do you know anything about this? Have you got a testimony tonight? Think about these words. The testimony of a sickly king. And here's what he testified. The crisis. The condition. The conversion. And the cleansing. Can you testify to that this evening? May the Lord bless these few words to you. Thank you for listening.